Hi there, I'm Physio Paul back again to continue the topic electrocardiogram. In the previous video we've discussed about the various types of electrocardiogram, but in this continuation video we are going to discuss about the conventional ECG machine, waves in electrocardiography, interpretation of those waves, and how that interpretation helps in detecting cardiac problems. So, let's start now with some preliminary theories before we enter the main topics. Electrocardiography is the process of producing an electrocardiogram, ECG or EKG. It is a graph of voltage versus time of the electrical activity of the heart using electrodes placed on the skin. These electrodes detect the small electrical changes that are a consequence of cardiac muscle depolarization followed by repolarization during each cardiac cycle heartbeat. Changes in the normal ECG pattern occur in numerous cardiac abnormalities, including cardiac rhythm disturbances such as atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia, inadequate coronary artery blood flow, such as myocardial ischemia and myocardial infarction, and electrolyte disturbances such as hyperkalemia and hyperkalemia, that is decrease and increase in potassium or calcium ion concentration. In a conventional 12-lead ECG, 10 electrodes are placed on the patient's limbs and on the surface of the chest. The overall magnitude of the heart's electrical potential is then measured from 12 different angles, leads, and is recorded over a period of time, usually 10 seconds. In this way, the overall magnitude and direction of the heart's electrical depolarization is captured at each moment throughout the cardiac cycle. There are three main components to an ECG, the P wave, which represents the depolarization of the atria, the QRS complex, which represents the depolarization of the ventricles, and the T wave, which represents the repolarization of the ventricles. During each heartbeat, a healthy heart has an orderly progression of depolarization that starts with pacemaker cells in the sinotrial node, spreads throughout the atrium, and passes through the atrioventricular node down into the bundle of his and into the Purkinje fibers, spreading down and to the left throughout the ventricles. This orderly pattern of depolarization gives rise to the characteristic ECG tracing. To the trained clinician, an ECG conveys a large amount of information about the structure of the heart and the function of its electrical conduction system. Among other things, an ECG can be used to measure the rate and rhythm of heartbeats, the size and position of the heart chambers, the presence of any damage to the heart's muscle cells or conduction system, the effects of heart drugs, and the function of implanted pacemakers. The overall goal of performing an ECG is to obtain information about the electrical function of the heart. Medical uses for this information are varied and often need to be combined with knowledge of the structure of the heart and physical examination signs to be interpreted. Some indications for performing an ECG include the following. 1. Chest pain or suspected myocardial infarction, heart attack such as ST elevated myocardial infarction, STEMI, or non-ST elevated myocardial infarction, NSTEMI. 2. Symptoms such as shortness of breath, murmurs, fainting, seizures, funny turns, or arrhythmias including new onset palpitations or monitoring of known cardiac arrhythmias. 3. Medication monitoring, e.g., drug-induced QT prolongation, digoxin toxicity, and management of overdose, e.g., tricyclic overdose. 4. Electrolyte abnormalities, such as hyperkalemia. 5. Perioperative monitoring in which any form of anesthesia is involved, e.g., monitored anesthesia care, general anesthesia. This includes preoperative assessment and intraoperative and postoperative monitoring. 6. Cardiac stress testing. 7. Computed tomography angiography CTA, and magnetic resonance angiography MRA, of the heart ECG is used to gate the scanning so that the anatomical position of the heart is steady. 8. Clinical cardiac electrophysiology, in which a catheter is inserted through the femoral vein and can have several electrodes along its length to record the direction of electrical activity from within the heart. ECGs can be recorded as short intermittent tracings or continuous ECG monitoring. Continuous monitoring is used for critically ill patients, patients undergoing general anesthesia, and patients who have an infrequently occurring cardiac arrhythmia that would unlikely be seen on a conventional 10-second ECG. Continuous monitoring can be conducted by using halter monitors, 
internal and external defibrillators and pacemakers, and or biotelemetry. Screening, evidence does not support the use of ECGs among those without symptoms or at low risk of cardiovascular disease as an effort for prevention. This is because an ECG may falsely indicate the existence of a problem, leading to misdiagnosis, the recommendation of invasive procedures, and overtreatment. However, persons employed in certain critical occupations, such as aircraft pilots, may be required to have an ECG as part of their routine health evaluations. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy screening may also be considered in adolescence as part of a sports physical out of concern for sudden cardiac death. So, I've given you necessary preliminary information about ECG. Now let me introduce one of my patients, Mr. Mukherjee, to you all. He had coronary arterial disease previously. After bypass graft surgery and following rehabilitation program, he is completely fit now. Today he has joined me for a reason what he will tell you about. Hi guys. I'm Mr. S. Mukherjee. My friend and physio Mr. Paul has already introduced me to you all as a former patient with CAD. Today I've joined him to support him as a partner for his tutorial YouTube channel. Seldom I will appear in his YouTube videos to share my experiences when I used to be a patient with a serious heart problem. That's right. Today Mr. Mukherjee is here to tell you all about ECG machine. So, please start, Mr. Mukherjee. Okay, let's start then. Electrocardiograms are recorded by machines that consist of a set of electrodes connected to a central unit. Early ECG machines were constructed with analog electronics, where the signal drove a motor to print out the signal onto paper. Today, electrocardiographs use analog to digital converters to convert the electrical activity of the heart to a digital signal. Many ECG machines are now portable and commonly include a screen, keyboard, and printer on a small wheel cart. Recent advancements in electrocardiography include developing even smaller devices for inclusion in fitness tracker and smart watches. These smaller devices often rely on only two electrodes to deliver a single lead eye portable. Six lead devices are also available. Recording an ECG is a safe and painless procedure. The machines are powered by mains power but they are designed with several safety features including an earthed ground plate. There are also some other features of it. Let Physio Paul describe it. Other features include, 1. Defibrillation protection. Any ECG used in healthcare may be attached to a person who requires defibrillation and the ECG needs to protect itself from this source of energy. 2. Electrostatic discharge is similar to defibrillation discharge and requires voltage protection up to 18,000 volts. 3. Additionally, circuitry called the right leg driver can be used to reduce common mode interference typically the 50 or 60 Hz mains power. 4. ECG voltages measured across the body are very small. This low voltage necessitates a low noise circuit, instrumentation amplifiers, and electromagnetic shielding. 5. Simultaneous lead recordings. Earlier designs recorded each lead sequentially, but current models record multiple leads simultaneously. Most modern ECG machines include automated interpretation algorithms. This analysis calculates features such as the PR interval, QT interval, corrected QT, QTC interval, PR axis, QRS axis, rhythm and more. The results from these automated algorithms are considered preliminary until verified and or modified by expert interpretation. Despite recent advances, computer misinterpretation remains a significant problem and can result in clinical mismanagement. Electrodes and leads in ECG. Electrodes are the actual conductive pads attached to the body surface. Any pair of electrodes can measure the electrical potential difference between the two corresponding locations of attachment. Such a pair forms a lead. However, leads can also be formed between a physical electrode and a virtual electrode, known as Wilson's Central Terminal WCT, whose potential is defined as the average potential measured by three limb electrodes that are attached to the right arm, the left arm, and the left foot, respectively. Commonly, 10 electrodes attached to the body are used to form 12 ECG leads, with each lead measuring a specific electrical potential difference. Leads are broken down into three types, limb, augmented limb, and precordial or chest. 
The 12 lead ECG has a total of 3 limb leads and 3 augmented limb leads arranged like spokes of a wheel in the coronal plane vertical, and 6 precordial leads or chest leads that lie on the perpendicular transverse plane horizontal. In medical settings, the term leads is also sometimes used to refer to the electrodes themselves, although this is technically incorrect. Two types of electrodes in common use are a flat paper thin sticker and a self-adhesive circular pad. The former are typically used in a single ECG recording while the latter are for continuous recordings as they stick longer. Each electrode consists of an electrically conductive electrolyte gel and a silver, silver chloride conductor. The gel typically contains potassium chloride, sometimes silver chloride as well, to permit electron conduction from the skin to the wire and to the electrocardiogram. The common virtual electrode, known as Wilson Central Terminal VW, is produced by averaging the measurements from the electrodes RA, LA, and LL to give an average potential of the body. In a 12-lead ECG, all leads except the limb leads are assumed to be unipolar AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. The measurement of a voltage requires two contacts and so, electrically, the unipolar leads are measured from the common lead negative and the unipolar lead positive. This averaging for the common lead and the abstract unipolar lead concept makes for a more challenging understanding and is complicated by sloppy usage of lead and electrode. In fact, instead of being a constant reference, BW has a value that fluctuates throughout the heart cycle. It also does not truly represent the center of heart potential due to the body parts the signals travel through. Limb lead. Leads I1, 2 and 3 are called the limb leads. The electrodes that form these signals are located on the limbs, one on each arm and one on the left leg. The limb leads form the points of what is known as Einthoven's triangle. Lead I is the voltage between the positive left arm L. A electrode and right arm R, A electrode. Lead 2 is the voltage between the positive left leg L, L electrode and the right arm R, A electrode. Lead 3 is the voltage between the positive left leg L, L electrode and the left arm L, A electrode. Augmented limb lead. Leads ABR, AVL, and AVF are the augmented limb leads. 
they are derived from the same three electrodes as leads I, 2, and 3, but they use Goldberger's central terminal as their negative pole. Goldberger's central terminal is a combination of inputs from two limb electrodes, with a different combination for each augmented lead. It is referred to immediately below as the negative pole, lead augmented vector right AVR has the positive electrode on the right arm. The negative pole is a combination of the left arm electrode and the left leg electrode, lead augmented vector left AVL has the positive electrode on the left arm. The negative pole is a combination of the right arm electrode and the left leg electrode, lead augmented vector foot AVF has the positive electrode on the left leg. The negative pole is a combination of the right arm electrode and the left arm electrode, together with leads I, 2, and 3, augmented limb leads AVR, AVL, and AVF form the basis of the hexaxial reference system, which is used to calculate the heart's electrical axis in the frontal plane. Older versions of the nodes VR, VL, VF use Wilson's central terminal as the negative pole, but the amplitude is too small for the thick lines of old ECG machines. The Goldberger terminal scale up augments the Wilson results by 50%, at the cost of sacrificing physical correctness by not having the same negative pole for all three. Precordial leads The precordial leads lie in the transverse horizontal plane, perpendicular to the other six leads. The six precordial electrodes act as the positive poles for the six corresponding precordial leads, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. Wilson's central terminal is used as the negative pole. Recently, unipolar precordial leads have been used to create bipolar precordial leads that explore the right-to-left axis in the horizontal plane. Specialized leads Additional electrodes may rarely be placed to generate other leads for specific diagnostic purposes. Right-sided precordial leads may be used to better study pathology of the right ventricle or for dextrocardia and are denoted with an R, e.g., V5R. Posterior leads V7 to V9 may be used to demonstrate the presence of a posterior myocardial infarction. A Lewis lead requiring an electrode at the right sternal border in the second intercostal space can be used to study pathological rhythms arising in the right atrium. Citation needed, an esophageal lead can be inserted to a part of the esophagus where the distance to the posterior wall of the left atrium is only approximately 5 to 6 mm remaining constant in people of different age and weight. An esophageal lead avails for a more accurate differentiation between certain cardiac arrhythmias, particularly atrial flutter, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia and orthodromic atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. It can also evaluate the risk in people with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, as well as terminate supraventricular tachycardia caused by reentry. An intracardiac electrogram ICEG is essentially an ECG with some added intracardiac leads that is inside the heart. The standard ECG leads, external leads are I, 2, 3, AVL, V1, and V6. Two to four intracardiac leads are added via cardiac catheterization. The word electrogram, EGM, without further specification usually means an intracardiac electrogram. Lead locations on an ECG report. A standard 12-lead ECG report, an electrocardiograph, shows a 2.5-second tracing of each of the 12 leads. The tracings are most commonly arranged in a grid of four columns and three rows. The first column is the limb leads, I, 2, and 3. The second column is the augmented limb leads, AVR, AVL, and AVF, and the last two columns are the precordial leads, V1 to V6. Additionally, a rhythm strip may be included as a fourth or fifth row. The timing across the page is continuous and not tracings of the 12 leads for the same time period. In other words, if the output were traced by needles on paper, each row would switch which leads as the paper is pulled under the needle. For example, the top row would first trace lead I, then switch to lead AVR, then switch to V1, and then switch to V4, and so none of these four tracings of the leads are from the same time period as they are traced in sequence through time. Contiguity of leads Each of the 12 ECG leads records the electrical activity of the heart from a different angle, 
and therefore align with different anatomical areas of the heart. Two leads that look at neighboring anatomical areas are said to be contiguous. In addition, any two precordial leads next to one another are considered to be contiguous. For example, though V4 is an anterior lead and V5 is a lateral lead, they are contiguous because they are next to one another. Electrophysiology. The study of the conduction system of the heart is called cardiac electrophysiology (EP). An EP study is performed via a right-sided cardiac catheterization. A wire with an electrode at its tip is inserted into the right heart chambers from a peripheral vein and placed in various positions in close proximity to the conduction system so that the electrical activity of that system can be recorded. Interpretation of the ECG is fundamentally about understanding the electrical conduction system of the heart. Normal conduction starts and propagates in a predictable pattern, and deviation from this pattern can be a normal variation or be pathological. An ECG does not equate with mechanical pumping activity of the heart, for example, pulseless electrical activity produces an ECG that should pump blood but no pulses are felt and constitutes a medical emergency and CPR should be performed. Ventricular fibrillation produces an ECG but is too dysfunctional to produce a life-sustaining cardiac output. Certain rhythms are known to have good cardiac output and some are known to have bad cardiac output. Ultimately, an echocardiogram or other anatomical imaging modality is useful in assessing the mechanical function of the heart. Like all medical tests, what constitutes normal is based on population studies. The heart rate range of between 60 and 100 beats per minute BPM is considered normal since data shows this to be the usual resting heart rate. Interpretation of ECG theory Interpretation of the ECG is ultimately that of pattern recognition. In order to understand the patterns found, it is helpful to understand the theory of what ECGs represent. The theory is rooted in electromagnetics and boils down to the four following points. 1. Depolarization of the heart towards the positive electrode produces a positive deflection. 2. Depolarization of the heart away from the positive electrode produces a negative deflection. 3. Repolarization of the heart towards the positive electrode produces a negative deflection. 4. Repolarization of the heart away from the positive electrode produces a positive deflection. Thus, the overall direction of depolarization and repolarization produces positive or negative deflection on each lead's trace. For example, Depolarizing from right to left would produce a positive deflection in lead I because the two vectors point in the same direction. In contrast, that same depolarization would produce minimal deflection in V1 and V2 because the vectors are perpendicular, and this phenomenon is called isoelectric. Normal rhythm produces four entities, a P wave, a QRS complex, a T wave, and a U wave, that each have a fairly unique pattern. 1. The P wave represents atrial depolarization. 2. The QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization. 3. The T wave represents ventricular repolarization. 4. The U wave represents papillary muscle repolarization. Changes in the structure of the heart and its surroundings, including blood composition, change the patterns of these four entities. The U wave is not typically seen and its absence is generally ignored. Atrial repolarization is typically hidden in the much more prominent QRS complex and normally cannot be seen without additional, specialized electrodes. Background grid. ECGs are normally printed on a grid. The horizontal axis represents time and the vertical axis represents voltage. The standard values on this grid are shown in the adjacent image. A small box is 1 mm times 1 mm and represents 0.1 millivolts times 0.04 seconds. 
A large box is 5 mm times 5 mm and represents 0.5 mV times 0.20 seconds. The large box is represented by a heavier line weight than the small boxes. Not all aspects of an ECG rely on precise recordings or having a known scaling of amplitude or time. For example, determining if the tracing is a sinus rhythm only requires feature recognition and matching, and not measurement of amplitudes or times, i.e., the scale of the grids are irrelevant. An example to the contrary, the voltage requirements of left ventricular hypertrophy require knowing the grid scale. Rate and Rhythm in a normal heart, the heart rate is the rate in which the sinotrial node depolarizes since it is the source of depolarization of the heart. Heart rate, like other vital signs such as blood pressure and respiratory rate, change with age. In adults, a normal heart rate is between 60 and 100 BPM normocardic whereas it is higher in children. A heart rate below normal is called bradycardia, less than 60 in adults and above normal is called tachycardia, greater than 100 in adults. A complication of this is when the atria and ventricles are not in synchrony and the heart rate must be specified as atrial or ventricular e.g., the ventricular rate in ventricular fibrillation is 300 to 600 bpm, whereas the atrial rate can be normal 60 to 100 or faster 100 to 150 in normal resting hearts, the physiologic rhythm of the heart is normal sinus rhythm NSR. Normal sinus rhythm produces the prototypical pattern of P wave, QRS complex, and T wave. Generally, deviation from normal sinus rhythm is considered a cardiac arrhythmia. Thus, the first question in interpreting an ECG is whether or not there is a sinus rhythm. A criterion for sinus rhythm is that P waves and QRS complexes appear one to one, thus implying that the P wave causes the QRS complex. Once sinus rhythm is established, or not, the second question is the rate. For a sinus rhythm, this is either the rate of P waves or QRS complexes since they are one to one. If the rate is too fast, then it is sinus tachycardia, and if it is too slow, then it is sinus bradycardia. If it is not a sinus rhythm, then determining the rhythm is necessary before proceeding with further interpretation. Some arrhythmias with characteristic findings, one absent P waves with irregularly irregular QRS complexes is the hallmark of atrial fibrillation. Two, a sawtooth pattern with QRS complexes is the hallmark of atrial flutter. Three, a sine wave pattern is the hallmark of ventricular flutter. Four, absent P waves with wide QRS complexes and a fast heart rate is ventricular tachycardia. Determination of rate and rhythm is necessary in order to make sense of further interpretation. Axis. The heart has several axes, but the most common by far is the axis of the QRS complex. References to the axis imply the QRS axis. Each axis can be computationally determined to result in a number representing degrees of deviation from zero, or it can be categorized into a few types. The QRS axis is the general direction of the ventricular depolarization wavefront or mean electrical vector in the frontal plane. It is often sufficient to classify the axis as one of three types, normal, left deviated, or right deviated. Population data shows that a normal QRS axis is from minus 30 degrees to 105 degrees, with 0 degrees being a long lead I and positive being inferior and negative being superior, best understood graphically as the hexaxial reference system. Beyond plus 105 degrees is right axis deviation and beyond minus 30 degrees is left axis deviation. The third quadrant of minus 90 degrees to minus 180 degrees is very rare and is an indeterminate axis. A shortcut for determining if the QRS axis is normal is if the QRS complex is mostly positive in lead I and lead 2 or lead I and AVF if plus 90 degrees is the upper limit of normal. The normal QRS axis is generally down and to the left, following the anatomical orientation of the heart within the chest. An abnormal axis suggests a change in the physical shape and orientation of the heart or a defect in its conduction system that causes the ventricles to depolarize in an abnormal way. The extent of a normal axis can be plus 90 degrees or 105 degrees depending on the source.
amplitudes and intervals. All of the waves on an ECG tracing and the intervals between them have a predictable time duration, a range of acceptable amplitudes, voltages, and a typical morphology. Any deviation from the normal tracing is potentially pathological and therefore of clinical significance. For ease of measuring the amplitudes and intervals, an ECG is printed on graph paper at a standard scale, each one millimeter one small box on the standard ECG paper represents 40 milliseconds of time on the x-axis and 0.1 millivolts on the y-axis. Now, we are going to watch a slideshow where description, related pathology and duration of the waves have been represented properly. Limb leads an electrical conduction through heart. The animation shown to the right illustrates how the path of electrical conduction gives rise to the ECG waves in the limb leads. Recall that a positive current, as created by depolarization of cardiac cells, traveling towards the positive electrode and away from the negative electrode creates a positive deflection on the ECG. Likewise, a positive current traveling away from the positive electrode and towards the negative electrode creates a negative deflection on the ECG. The red arrow represents the overall direction of travel of the depolarization. 
the magnitude of the red arrow is proportional to the amount of tissue being depolarized at that instance. The red arrow is simultaneously shown on the axis of each of the three limb leads. Both the direction and the magnitude of the red arrow's projection onto the axis of each limb led is shown with blue arrows. Then, the direction and magnitude of the blue arrows are what theoretically determine the deflections on the ECG. For example, as a blue arrow on the axis for lead I moves from the negative electrode to the right, towards the positive electrode, the ECG line rises, creating an upward wave. As the blue arrow on the axis for lead I moves to the left, a downward wave is created. The greater the magnitude of the blue arrow, the greater the deflection on the ECG for that particular limb lead. Frames 1 to 3 depict the depolarization being generated in and spreading through the sinotrial node. The SA node is too small for its depolarization to be detected on most ECGs. Frames 4 to 10 depict the depolarization traveling through the atria, towards the atrioventricular node. During frame 7, the depolarization is traveling through the largest amount of tissue in the atria, which creates the highest point in the P wave. Frames 11 to 12 depict the depolarization traveling through the AV node. Like the SA node, the AV node is too small for the depolarization of its tissue to be detected on most ECGs. This creates the flat PR segment. Frame 13 depicts an interesting phenomenon in an oversimplified fashion. It depicts the depolarization as it starts to travel down the interventricular septum, through the bundle of his and bundle branches. After the bundle of his, the conduction system splits into the left bundle branch and the right bundle branch. Both branches conduct action potentials at about 1 meter per second. Interestingly, however, the action potential starts traveling down the left bundle branch about 5 milliseconds before it starts traveling down the right bundle branch, as depicted by frame 13. This causes the depolarization of the interventricular septum tissue to spread from left to right, as depicted by the red arrow in frame 14. In some cases, this gives rise to a negative deflection after the PR interval, creating a Q wave such as the one seen in lead eye in the animation to the right. Depending on the mean electrical axis of the heart, this phenomenon can result in a Q wave in lead 2 as well. Following depolarization of the interventricular septum, the depolarization travels towards the apex of the heart. This is depicted by frames 15 to 17 and results in a positive deflection on all three limb leads, which creates the R wave. Frames 18 to 21 then depict the depolarization as it travels throughout both ventricles from the apex of the heart, following the action potential in the Purkinje fibers. This phenomenon creates a negative deflection in all three limb leads, forming the S wave on the ECG. Repolarization of the atria occurs at the same time as the generation of the QRS complex, but it is not detected by the ECG since the tissue mass of the ventricles is so much larger than that of the atria. Ventricular contraction occurs between ventricular depolarization and repolarization. During this time, there is no movement of charge, so no deflection is created on the ECG. This results in the flat street segment after the S wave. Frames 24 to 28 in the animation depict repolarization of the ventricles. The epicardium is the first layer of the ventricles to repolarize, followed by the myocardium. The endocardium is the last layer to repolarize. The plateau phase of depolarization has been shown to last longer in endocardial cells than in epicardial cells. This causes repolarization to start from the apex of the heart and move upwards. Since repolarization is the spread of negative current as membrane potentials decrease back down to the resting membrane potential, the red arrow in the animation is pointing in the direction opposite of the repolarization. This therefore creates a positive deflection in the ECG, and creates the T wave. Ischemia and infarction. Ischemia or non-street elevation myocardial infarctions non-STEMIs may manifest as St. Depression or inversion of T waves. It may also affect the high-frequency band of the QRS. St. Elevation Myocardial Infarctions STEMIs, have different characteristic ECG findings based on the amount of time elapsed since the ME first occurred. The earliest sign is hyperacute T waves, P 
peak T waves due to local hyperkalemia in ischemic myocardium. This then progresses over a period of minutes to elevations of the Saint segment by at least 1 mm. Over a period of hours, a pathologic Q wave may appear and the T wave will invert. Over a period of days the Saint elevation will resolve. Pathologic Q waves generally will remain permanently. The coronary artery that has been occluded can be identified in and STEMI based on the location of Saint elevation. The left anterior descending lat artery supplies the anterior wall of the heart and therefore causes street elevations in anterior leads V1 and V2. The LCX supplies the lateral aspect of the heart and therefore causes street elevations in lateral leads I, AVL and V6. The right coronary artery RCA usually supplies the inferior aspect of the heart and therefore causes street elevations in inferior leads 2, 3 and AVF. Artifacts. An ECG tracing is affected by patient motion. Some rhythmic motions, such as shivering or tremors, can create the illusion of cardiac arrhythmia. Artifacts are distorted signals caused by a secondary internal or external sources, such as muscle movement or interference from an electrical device. Distortion poses significant challenges to healthcare providers, who employ various techniques and strategies to safely recognize these false signals. Medical citation needed accurately separating the ECG artifact from the true ECG signal can have a significant impact on patient outcomes and legal liabilities. Improper lead placement, for example, reversing two of the limb leads, has been estimated to occur in 0.4% to 4% of all ECG recordings, and has resulted in improper diagnosis and treatment including unnecessary use of thrombolytic therapy. Diagnosis. Numerous diagnoses and findings can be made based upon electrocardiography, and many are discussed above. Overall, the diagnoses are made based on the patterns. For example, an irregularly irregular QRS complex without P waves is the hallmark of atrial fibrillation. However, other findings can be present as well, such as a bundle branch block that alters the shape of the QRS complexes. ECGs can be interpreted in isolation but should be applied, like all diagnostic tests, in the context of the patient. For example, an observation of peak T waves is not sufficient to diagnose hyperkalemia, such a diagnosis should be verified by measuring the blood potassium level. Conversely, a discovery of hyperkalemia should be followed by an ECG for manifestations such as peak T waves, widened QRS complexes, and loss of P waves. The following is an organized list of possible ECG-based diagnoses.